have a Bible, go ahead and be turning to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, that won't be the, the first passage uh, that we necessarily turn to, uh, but it, it'll uh, come here just in a moment. Again, good to be with you this morning. As was already briefly mentioned, we do have uh, several holes in our audience uh, this morning. I believe some uh, camps are starting up, so that, that accounts, I know, for uh, some of the absence. But uh, we do have some visiting with us this morning as well, and glad that you're here with us. Um, <clears throat> going to be talking about uh, a topic that's, I'm sure, not unfamiliar uh, to most of us here, but I, again, I do think it's one that's important. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So here in Hebrews, we have faith and we have hope, both very closely tied to one another in many ways. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which I know Brother West will get to uh, here in, in a lesson or two in that series on 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 13, but now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And so the greatest is love, but they're in that list of even things that we associate really maybe most of all with our walk as Christians, hope is there. And that word hope is, is thrown around a lot. Uh, in our culture today, it has for some time. I hope to do this. I hope to go and do that. Uh, really with the expectation that there isn't a great expectation this is going to happen. I hope that it will happen. It might happen, but I'm not really sure about it. Um, but when we come to Scripture, either the Old Testament or the New, when that word is used, it's not used like that. It's not used as, eh, it might happen. Uh, it's more of a sure thing. Uh, when you've studied this topic before, when you've looked at it, you might have heard it described as a desired expectation. And I think that's still a, a pretty good uh, description of what's described in Scripture. Um, those two elements, desire and expectation, are really the, the two core elements uh, that are involved in this type of hope. We desire something to happen, and we expect it to happen as well. So uh, if you have one of those without the other, we can understand those ramifications as well. Uh, you know, I, I really have no, I don't really have a desire, but let, let's say that I did, uh, to go to space on a rocket. I really, really want to do that. Do I expect it's going to happen? No. <laughs> uh, you know, I think, uh, is it Elon Musk that uh, maybe, maybe not at this point, but he had been sending people to space in his own private, uh, private rocket, and you have to have so many millions of dollars to do so. I don't expect that to ever happen to myself. So there's a desire, but there's not really an expectation, or, or say it's on the other side of that. Uh, no one would say, if they have a family history uh, of, a, of a certain disease or, or something, that I desire for that to happen to me. They might expect it to happen, but that's certainly not uh, something they would desire for themselves or, frankly, for anyone else. But we join both of those together with anything else in our lives, uh, apart from anything spiritually, and we understand that as well. So. Those of you that are married or hope to be married, uh, you are dating someone with the hope to marry this individual. That's something you desire, and say you get engaged, there is then an expectation because you've got a date set, and that comes, that hope is fulfilled, and, and we understand that. But we also understand that uh, when we come to the subject in terms of spiritual things, there are those who live without hope. And this is a short list. There are really many, uh, many different types of people that we could uh, list under any of, these, uh, any of these groupings. There might be more, but these are uh, at least many of them. There, of course, is the one who says there is no hope. There is the atheist, the one who uh, certainly doesn't believe in our God or any other God. 
I say there's nothing. Um, and so there is no desire that they have, and there's no expectation. We might even lump in the agnostic in this grouping as well. They say, yeah, I would, I would hope that, you know, that's something I might desire, but I don't have any expectation that's actually there. Uh, and so they certainly don't have uh, this type of hope. There's also the one, of course, who has not acted on the hope that they've talked or, or that they've heard uh, talked about. They have not obeyed. They have not obeyed the gospel. We've even talked about some of that this morning in our class. Um, and not only that, but those who know God's plan for their salvation, and they have not, uh, again, they haven't acted upon it. They've put their faith in someone or, or something else, and they choose another path in life apart from God. And then, of course, there is the one who has a false hope. The one who thinks they have a hope, but it's, it's a false one. Uh, those that claim to live by the standard of God, we do all in the name of Jesus Christ. They might use that sort of language. But in reality, they live by another standard, which is standard of self. Uh, Matthew 7, 21 through 23 is a, is a good place to go. There's many, but not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. So there, there are those who claim to have hope, who claim uh, to have the hope that God has promised, but uh, as we've already seen in James in that study, and as we're going to continue to see, you may say that you're doing one thing, but your actions tell us that that is not true. That's double-mindedness. So, it's not enough to just be sincere. It's not enough just to be a quote-unquote good person, whatever that means, because that can, that's pretty subjective, isn't it? Uh, we must be good in the sense of being good according to God's standard. To God's standard. To His truth. Not our own, not someone else's, but to His because if we don't conduct ourselves in that way, then everything else is really, it really is faulty and, and shifty. And it's like that wise man versus the foolish man, building your house on the rock or the sand. So again, this is, a, this is an old lesson, but I think one that's certainly needed. Our hope is, is in God. And it's not attainable on our own. So you're there in 1 Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1. Look with me there at verse 18. 1 Peter 1 and verse 18. Uh, let's, let's back up to verse 17, actually. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges, judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in, the, in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Our faith and our hope, they are, not, they are not of ourselves, they are not in ourselves. It is not put in the fact that we ourselves can, uh, can become good and great and perfect by ourselves. Someone else has come in and provided a way for that to be attainable. So we can achieve and attain great things, things that are to be hoped for. But again, those things are in God, and we'll talk more about that uh, here in just a little bit. Turn over to 1 John chapter 1 now. 1 John chapter 1. There are just a few pages in your Bible. 1 John chapter 1 and in verse 5. Where can we find this hope? Peter already kind of talked about that, but let's go over here to John 1 John 1, verse 5, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 
If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And then 2 in verse 1, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Where can we find this hope? How is this hope achieved? It is in the fact, it is in the fact that Jesus Christ did come and offered a new and a better way. Isn't that what the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews talks about? A better way, a better sacrifice. And so we accept that way. We accept that way by obedience. We're forgiven of, of that which is not part of the plan, and that is sin that separates us from God. And so now, as John says here, we no longer walk in darkness because darkness can have no part with God. So what is the opposite of darkness? Light. We walk in the light as He is in the light. And we, we continue to reach with every fiber of our being for that light. We may stumble into darkness at times, but we need to keep reaching for that light. And if we do stumble, what does John say here? We have an advocate. If we confess our sins to our God, then he is faithful and just to forgive them because he said that he would. And so this is a real type of hope, isn't it? It's not just, I'll just throw this up here and maybe God can do something about it. Maybe, maybe he'll forgive me. He has said, if you come to me in this way with a penitent heart, you repent, you ask for forgiveness, I will give it to you. That's a sure and steadfast hope that we have. Now, with that, I hope we also have a desire to be forgiven of sins. It's not that oh, I really don't want to give this up, but I'll ask for forgiveness, and I'll expect that to happen. You have to have the desire to have those sins taken away with also the expectation that that is going to happen as well. So, <clears throat> like it is with so many things, self-satisfaction brings no real comfort. Tur turn over to Revelation now. Very last letter of the New Testament, this letter of prophecy, Revelation 3 and in verse 14, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither, uh, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. There is no comfort or hope for even the Christian who becomes self-satisfied with what they are doing in their life. They become comfortable, complacent, and okay uh, with no matter how close they might get to sin, and no matter what distance uh, they continue to, to draw away from God. One who no longer desires to live under any sort of standard that God has given. There's no comfort or hope for that Christian. There is also no hope or comfort for anyone who is moving in the wrong direction. You might fill a pew, and you may have all the uh, the appearances of walking in the right direction, but what about the, the rest of the time? That we're in the world, that we're doing those things that are apart from God. We may not be uh, complacent, but we may certainly be moving in the wrong direction as well. 
So instead of, com of complacency, instead of taking another path, we have to put in the effort every day, every minute of every day, and continue to reach, uh, reach toward that perfection that, that God has offered through his Son and to be diligent to continue to ask for God's forgiveness when we do, when we do stumble. This is also, uh, as many of the New Testament writers describe, a living hope. Turn back over to 1 Peter chapter 1. All right, 1 Peter chapter 1, and look with me there now at, uh, at verse 3. Back over here, 1 Peter chapter 1, and in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. A living hope that does not fade away. Brother West talked about a place that has been prepared for us. We sung about that just before. Uh, I know that my Redeemer lives, and since I know that, I know that there is a place prepared for me. That's the type of hope that we have. So because of what Jesus has already accomplished in his death, in his burial, and most importantly, in his resurrection, because if the resurrection doesn't happen, all of this is for naught. doesn't matter. Because he has done that, we now have an inheritance that is what, Peter says. It is incorruptible, and it's not going to fade away. It's not going anywhere. It's sure. It's a sure and living hope. And so we too, the faithful of God, and Peter even mentions that here in, in verse 5, we will be raised on the last day. And as authors mention in other places, what's going to happen? When the Lord comes back, if we're still here, we meet him in the air. The dead be raised first, those that are faithful in him. We meet him in the air. Now, this type of hope, though it is a, I didn't advance the slide there, though this is a living hope, just because it's a sure and steadfast thing that we can put our hope in, does that mean it's not going to come under attack? Every day, this hope is under attack. And we have to be ready, and we have to be watching. It might be brought into question as to whether or not this is the type of hope that we have. This is why an active faith, not one that is complacent or moving in the wrong direction, is so important. Because the, the devil is continually trying to take that away from us. So we have to be adamant in doing that. Now, why is this a hope worth reaching towards? Why is this one that we even should put our stock in how can we trust that this is, this is a real uh, and living thing? Over in Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 23, Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. We've seen that phrase already, haven't we? So because the one who promised this hope is faithful... That's how Jesus is described over in Revelation 3, the amen, the faithful witness. He's given assurance. He cannot lie. And we know that he's faithful because he's fulfilled his promises time and time and time again. There are over, I think, 300 prophecies in the Old Testament, each and every single one of those fulfilled through Christ. And the most important ones, perhaps, we might say, the ones that speak of that death, burial, and resurrection. We have that sure hope. Over in Romans chapter 8, if you want to turn over there now, Romans chapter 8. And 
and uh, in verse 35, Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when you think back to 1 Corinthians 13 that we mentioned at the beginning, we have faith, hope, and love. All of those three things, I believe, very closely tied together as well. Not just faith and hope. We have love as well. Because of the love that has been shown to us, we have confidence in that hope. We have confidence in our faith. And there is absolutely nothing, Paul says here, nothing in the heavenly realm or even here on earth that is able to separate us from that love, from the love of God, and nothing that can separate us from the promises that have been made to us. Now, <clears throat> what are some of those things that... Uh, that envelop that hope, that are included in uh, this type of hope. Well, Revelation, uh, we've already mentioned, gives us some glimpse into some of this. Of course, a lot of this being uh, uh, symbolic in many ways. But Revelation 21 and in verse 4, we get a glimpse of this. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So there is, there is not going to be anything in heaven that is unpleasant here on earth. All of the unpleasantness will be done away with. No sickness, no dying, no tears, no sorrow, no pain of any kind. Sounds pretty good doesn't it? And I fear that maybe some of the time that, uh, certainly when the world talks about it, but maybe even when we talk about heaven, we think about it in these terms only. There's no pain, there's no sickness, there's no dying, there's no tears. That's why we're looking forward to it. So we're just sitting back in our lazy boy recliner for eternity, just enjoying it. Heaven is a lot more than that, isn't it? It's because of the one that is there in heaven that allows all of the pain and the suffering and the tears to be done away with. We go because God is there. Because God's presence is there, none of the unpleasant things are there. He is the light, the one and true light. So, through all of this, Heaven is our anchor. We sing a song about that as well. It's taken from this passage in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6. And in verse 19. Let's back up to verse 17, actually, just to get a little more context here. Hebrews 6, verse 17. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two, but that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The, uh, the LSB translation says this confirmed hope. It's confirmed. It's set. It won't be taken away. No matter what storms might come into our lives to try and make a shipwreck of things, where it seems like everything else is being taken away, we still have this anchor. 
This anchor that keeps us sure and steadfast amidst the trials. We've talked about some of that in James, especially in chapter 1. The anchor of heaven that keeps us uh, sane even amidst this life and all that we have to deal with. There's a song, uh, I don't know that I've led this in the assembly. My God, I thank you who have made. It's a beautiful hymn. And the, the, the melody is beautiful, but it's only beautiful because of the words. And it talks about through every season of life, whether it's in the valleys, whether it's in the mountain or on the mountains, there are good things to be had, and God provides those blessings. One of, the, one of the verses reads this way, I thank you more that all our joy is touched with pain, that shadows fall on darkest hours, that thorns remain, so that earth's bliss may be our guide and not our chain. We have pain in this life. Every one of us experiences that. When we learn that the pain is a lesson to, to not keep us tethered to this world, because there are many pleasurable things in this world, and God has given us those blessings. But when we experience that pain, then we're reminded of what's beyond, aren't we? And we're reminded of the one that we go to be with for eternity. All of earth's blessings, no matter where we may find them, point us to the goodness of God. All of the ugliness that we may find in this world reminds us that if we endure the trials, if we remain steadfast, then we can take hold of that steadfast hope. Now, <clears throat> there are even many uh, in there are many in the atheistic community, and again, we can include a lot of people in that category. Uh, they tend, it seems, to really shudder at the, uh, at the fact that eternity is this thing that's talked about and maybe even a possibility with the agnostics. We have this eternal existence that just, just goes on and on and on. You read a lot of, if you read uh, you know, science fiction and fantasy like I do, then that, that uh, plot point is used a lot where you, you live forever, or you live for an extend, uh, extended amount of time. And why is that something that's not hoped for? Because you see all these loved ones die generation after generation, and you can't hold on to those attachments. Okay, If we're talking about it in that way, perhaps that would be something uh, that is not to be hoped for. I was listening, or I listened to a podcast uh, uh, just about every week when they release one. And it's by two secular authors, uh, both uh, fantasy authors, uh, and they're both Mormon. They're both Mormons, and I don't know one as well as the other, but he was talking, they were talking about this, uh, this existence of eternity, and he was talking about it in that way that it is a fearful thing. He's like, I don't really know if I want that, just going on and on and on forever and ever, and of course they don't believe about God and Jesus in the same way that we do. They believe they too can become gods. Um, and he was talking about just eternity seems like in that way that we're just kind of slipping into the void and we lose all, all uh, notions of what's real and what's not and all these sorts of things. You know what I didn't hear one single time in that discussion? I heard no mention of God and I heard no mention of Jesus Christ. So yeah, without those, those in the picture... Eternity might be a fearful thing. You know what that is? That's hell. That's what he was talking about. He wasn't mentioning it. But just going on and on and on without God in the picture. There is eternal life and there is eternal damnation. And if we are not remaining steadfast here, then we're going to be where we wanted to be all along, which was apart from God. Heaven is only heaven because it is the dwelling place of God. And we have that hope of being in his presence forever, reestablishing that relationship that was lost in the garden. 
back in Genesis chapter uh, chapter two and on into chapter three. And we get you know we get very very excited for so many things in life. You know we're in uh, uh, the summer season right now. A lot of people are going on vacation, going to exciting places. And you know, you, you plan those trips, you get excited for them, the anticipation builds, and you know, we have a lot of fun, we're together as families, and all those things. But maybe we become so fixated on those things that we lose sight of all of the excitement and all of the joy that should be uh, with heaven, with that hope. Um, you know, you see a lot of lists in uh, uh, travel, I, say, I was about to say magazines, those aren't really a thing anymore, travel blogs uh, and forums and so forth, 100 places to visit before you die. And I don't know who's able to visit 100 places like the places they're talking about before they die, it's certainly not me. Uh, I might get to five of them, maybe, uh, and that's even a stretch. But. Uh, one of the places that I hope, uh, I don't really have an expectation, but I hope uh, to visit New Zealand one day because I want to see where the hobbits lived, okay? Just put that out there. That's why I want to go. Uh, it's a beautiful landscape as well. Fill in the blank with whatever place you want to go to one day. If you reach heaven... Do you really think you're going to be saying, man, I really wanted to go to New Zealand before I got here. Really regret I didn't get to, I only got to 17 places. I didn't get to 100. Can I go back? No, <laughs> we're not going to be saying that because that's the only place that matters. It's the, only, it's the only place that's real in so many ways. And so we, we live in hope that one day that one day we will die in hope. And that's really the, the final point that I want to cover this morning. Turn over to Philippians uh, chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And look with me there at verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh... This will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. So Paul talks about here that he would rather go on to the hope that, uh, that is secured for him. But he realized that there was still work to be done. And he was needed there with the brethren that he was even writing to. But by 2 Timothy, Paul has gotten a lot older in life and he sees the end coming near over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 6. 2 Timothy 4 verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering... And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He knows that the end has come, that his hour has come. But it is also the beginning in so many ways for Paul. The beginning of a new life, an eternal life. Paul knew the will of God. He had preached that to so many through the known world at that time. 
He'd striven to keep it even in the midst of things we can't even imagine going through. And he kept it. And Paul sums up his whole life by saying, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so if we, like Paul, as he offers here in verse 8, if we, like Paul, can say in full confidence that to live is Christ, then we can know that for ourselves, to die is gain. It is much gain. If we live in hope, then we know that we will die in hope. And when we die in hope, we die in faith. Again, going back to 1 Corinthians 13, I'm, I'm trying not to steal so much thunder from Brother West when he gets back and he continues this series. But, you know, when we, when we get to heaven, we get to that eternal home. Here on earth, we have faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Faith and hope we aren't going to need anymore when we reach that eternal home. You know why? Because when we reach heaven, all that we have had faith in, the one that we have been faithful to, that faith is now sight. He's right there in front of us. That hope that we've been uh, talking about that's been secured for us, now we're there. Nothing to hope for anymore. But you know what's still there? Love. The love of God. God is love. He has loved us. We love Him. And we are there with Him for eternity. I want to read one final passage with you this morning. Over in, uh, again in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verse 12. Philippians 2 and in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We must obey, trust and obey. And in doing so, we work out our own salvation. And God works through us. Are you doing that? Are you doing that for yourself? It's the question that we have to ask ourselves, not only just in this assembly, when we come to the what we call the invitation. That invitation is always open. No matter what day, no matter what hour of the day. But this is a good opportunity for all of us to reflect on whether or not we are, uh, we are living up to the desire and the expectation of God. And that is to serve Him faithfully. So, if you have not become a part of the family of God, you can do that this very morning. Maybe you've drifted. Maybe you've come to put your security and your hope in other things of this world. And you can come back and... We would be more than happy to help you with that, to pray with you. And whatever your need might be, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?